Flashes and Cold Topics, a podcast for women in midlife and beyond. At Hot Flashes and Cold Topics, we talk about anything and everything to do with midlife. My name is Bridget. And I'm Colleen. And today we are so excited. We have Melanie Chardoff on. And some of you may remember her from the TV show Fridays. She also did the voice of Dee Dee Pickles. She has been just, in just, numerous shows. You just stop right there, okay? <laughs> oh, I know. I know. I can't And the grandmother. That. And she did an example of it on the show. Yes, you have to us. listen to find oh. Dee Dee Pickles for us. It was awesome. <laughs> yeah. It's the little things that get me so excited. When she did I that, know, and, I was like, oh my God. Uh, my kids will die. They will die. And so, uh, but she also. Odd Woman oh, Out. She has a new book coming out called Odd Woman Out. And she actually does the Audible. So, and she's very funny. I mean, she's a comedian. She's an actress. She's done Broadway. She's an author. She's a voiceover actress. I mean, you name it. And now she does, she teaches charisma, which is amazing. Yes. Mm -hmm. She does everything. Yeah. But Odd Woman Out, Exposures and Essays and Stories is the name of her book coming out in the beginning of February. Um, and Bridget wants to give a shout out. Go ahead, Bridget. Oh, yeah. We want to give a shout out to Melanie's mom. Because Melanie, she's 96. she said she hasn't been able to see her in over a year. And so we wanted to give her a shout out because uh, we know that she'll listen to things like this. So thank you, Melanie's mom. For I really hope you're Melanie. not mad at me for saying your age. Sorry. About yeah, that. <laughs> which, hey, I would celebrate it. I would celebrate that age. I'm celebrating 53 and I hope to be 96 and celebrate it. Exactly. Okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, we have a great conversation with Melanie. She is funny. She is talented. She has some great stories about the era of the 70s. Um, you know, we try to touch on some Fridays, yeah. from the book. Yes, they had a show on ABC called Fridays, which kind of was in competition with SNL. So she has some great stories about um, the comedians running the circuit and the improv. I mean, just what a great time, those the 70s and all the people that she was hanging out with. There were so many stories in the book that I feel like we could only touch on a couple of them because right. she kind of experienced so much of the, the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. Um, it's a great book for perseverance. Just, you know, if you just keep trying at something, if it's your passion and you just keep doing it, that it will probably work out for you. And I love too how she is in, was in it for, because she loved it, not to become famous, not to make a lot of money, this is just what she was really passionate about doing. Was right, doing and she kind of is very casual when she talks about hanging, you know, closing for Robin Williams on the circuit. It was just kind of, oh, I, I'm like, how do you not, you know, that is, that yeah. should be the pinnacle of a career, yet there were so many other pinnacles for her. Pinnacles, right, personal pinnacles. And she's her. very casual about it and very humble about it. She's not, Yeah. she really was in it because she loved the talent. She loved the raw talent and was attracted to being with people who have that. Yes. So we are going to let her do the talking on this episode. We hope you enjoy it and we will talk to you after. Welcome back to Hot Flashes and Cool Topics, everybody. Today we have on Melanie Chardoff and she is an actress. She's an author and one of my personal favorites, she's the voice of Dee Dee Pickles, which come on, those our generation knows that our kids love drug rats. So I cannot wait to talk about that. But welcome, Melanie. Thank you, girls. It's great to be with you. You know, we're so isolated in lockdown right now in LA that you're the first fresh faces I've seen in weeks. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. You're powering your faces. <laughs> but thank you for coming on. We are excited to talk about your journey. Um, as we mentioned, or as I mentioned, you have a new book coming out. It's called Odd Woman Out, Exposure and Essays and Stories. And it's really a great book. It's, it's just like a combination of essays at different points in time in your life. And it starts out with a hysterical one um, with um, Larry Flint at Hustlers, which uh, if that doesn't catch you in the book, can you just give us a little snippet of that story and what happened? Well, yes, I was going through a very lonely time. I had not had a love relationship in a number of years and my gynecological expert who tends to be very frank with all of his patients said, use it or lose it. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean by that? He said, well, if you want to get ready for love, you need to keep your muscles in order. And I was very shocked by this. I thought he was kidding, but he gave me a prescription slip to buy a uh, dildo. 
And I said, well, where on earth would I get this? It was really before the advent of the uh, internet really taking off and certainly internet sex toys were not a, a known entity at that time. And he uh, gave me the address of this brand new hustler store that was opening the following week on the Sunset Strip in Los Angeles. And I thought, I can't go there. What if somebody sees me? I, it's, it's just too humiliating. It would be too humiliating. And what if my mother found out? And I had all these sort of <laughs> nice Jewish girl repressions <laughs> that were all supposed to have. And so I went the morning of its opening before any of the festivities were beginning. And they were still sanding the floors and wheeling in equipment. And I had a kind of a private shopping experience. I was, I assumed, all by myself in there. And uh, I made my selection. And as I was turning to leave the cash register, I heard someone say, we're rolling. And I turned around into a bank of spotlights. Larry Flint was sitting about six feet in front of me in his wheelchair being interviewed for entertainment tonight. <laughs> So I immediately turned away and tried to back out of the shot, but I am seen in the B-roll that evening. I don't know if the historians can ever dig that up, but I am seen <laughs> fleeing the building. And I thought nobody saw me, nobody will recognize me. Nobody would think a nice girl like me would be in a place like that at <laughs> nine in the morning. And of course I was caught apparently by photographers who were outside the building getting ready for the launch that day. And I was uh, put onto the centerfold of, um, the worst dress list in the Star Magazine Thanksgiving week when I thought none of my friends will see this, but they were all in line in the eight, 10 items or less line at the grocery store. And they were all picking through the tabloids and they called me and let me know about this. But oddly, they didn't have any, uh, any uh, judgments about it. And that's what kind of <laughs> began to alter my path. It was like, well, then I guess this is not so horrible. And, you know, as I had feared, yeah. And luckily, my mother didn't know what the Hustler store even was. <laughs> so people sent her copies of the clippings. Here's your wonderful daughter. She really didn't know what it was. So that was a saving grace. Which is just such a great story. And the cover of your book, which has you in the trench coat and the sunglasses. Which, I can't believe they knew who you were. Uh, you know, when, if it's the cover of the book, when you said you put the trench coat and the sunglasses on. Yes. I was like, how did they figure out. I mean, I guess they, had, I guess they do. You know? yes, I don't know. At a certain point in your career, and, it, and this was sort of when my career was sort of subsiding in terms of being a celebrity, um, they've seen your face at enough angles, at enough events that you can't really completely mask. So um, they got me. What can I say? <laughs> I, I know when you said he pulled out the prescription, I was like, oh, do they sell those at pharmacies? <laughs> like before I read further? Yeah. <laughs> I think that was just this, the scrap paper that he had on hand. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a story. That is it was my help, and it actually did give me faith and hope and more muscular strength, shall we say, <laughs> um, for what was to come, so to speak. Yes. yes. <laughs> Unintended. <though. laughs> yes. yes. So yeah, that, that chapter really grabs you. You're like, okay, I got to read more. I've got to read exactly. more. Exactly. Yes. It's a great yes. way to kind of start the book. And, you know, you talk about your journey through your career and you started very young. Um, and it kind of sounded like you did a little bit of everything. You could sing. You were very funny. You could act. And I noticed in the very beginning, it was like, oh, and I got this kind of stint at Yale. And I'm like, you were 16 going to Yale, you know, to do the, how did that oh, no. out? have women at Yale in my day. So whenever they needed women for plays, they would cast in New Haven. And so I took the bus and auditioned and got cast. It was wonderful. I thought all theater would be that way. Lavish, expensive, gorgeous, Broadway, state-of-the-art theater. Of course, it wasn't, you know, mm -hmm. but that was my, my intro experience into theater. Just right. And, and the whole, and the dance that you, uh, you and a friend, she needed someone to dance with her. And that's kind of how you got started. Now, did you have formal dance lessons or did you just learn that? Later, I, I was just, you know, on Connecticut bandstand doing the pop and the twist and, you know, all those dances of, of yesteryear. They're still in my body, those dances. It's odd. I can bring them up any anytime I want to. Maybe you've had the same experience. The dances of your childhood are still in you. Right. And then when you whip them out at parties, everybody scorns you because everybody else is doing, you know, stop and lock and hip hop. <laughs> and we're <laughs> trying to do the electric slide. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> so, yeah. Exactly. And they're twerking and all these 
things and we were more modest in our, our dances. But yes, she and I were on the bar mitzvah circuit in New Haven. There was a very competitive bar mitzvah circuit where all the, the young men having their manhood handed to them on a very expensive platter would have these lavish parties, safari bar mitzvahs where they'd bring an elephant. And I was at one of the more expensive uh, bar mitzvahs. And I was a very wholesome girlfriend. My a girl, my girlfriend and I we were both very uh, clean cut. And we did the clean, modest little dances that we learned from television. And um, we were quite the hit. And then I guess Phil Spector was a guest at this bar mitzvah that I premiered at. And then he hired us. So we, um, we participated in an evening at, at Yale University where the Ronettes and the Crystals went on. Yeah. And we got to back them up, and that was a thrill. That was such a thrill. I that was is so amazing. <laughs> and I know, I know. Oh, oh my goodness. And, and actually, when I was reading what you were paid at that time, that is really good. I mean, <laughs> that's actually, I know people that would take that right now. Yeah. And like, that was quite a bit of money, you know. I guess they expected more of us than we delivered. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no. Um, no, we were wholesome and clean, and she had a, she was with a modeling agency, so she had a very good reputation and already a career at the age of 17, so that helped me kind of get into a respectable position, but then when I resumed my go-go curl career later, the entire genre had slid into a, a very dark area, so I didn't know that. I didn't read the paper in college. I was too busy being in plays. I didn't know that that category was now considered tasteless. Oh. Wow, Very it's still bad. my it's still my dream to have go go boots. I never got my white go go boots. So well, now I know what you're getting for Christmas. Oh, next. Thank you, Colleen. There you go. Size nine. Size. They have them nine. on eBay. Size. Yes. Nine. Yes. I'll get. Some. But I did study legitimate dance later. When I went to New York, I studied ballet for quite a while and became somewhat of a, a dancer, not a, more of a singer than a dancer. But I was what they call a dancer who could move. Oh, I was a singer who could move. Excuse me. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Not a great dancer, but I knew how to carry myself. There was a way of carrying yourself like a ballerina that really mm -hmm. gave you sophistication or dignity that you weren't entitled to. You would just lead with your chest and keep your chin and your neck elongated at all times, hold in your tummy. And if you walk around like that, um, it's good for the whole body, keeps you strong, and gives you a kind of a, a presence that people respect. Huh. You know? And you also talk about in the book that you learned pretty early on that some of the actors and Broadway um, people that you were with did not necessarily um, take women seriously and took advantage of your beauty and your youth. And you actually talk about Ed Asner, which was devastating for me because I loved Ed Asner. <laughs> I, lo I love him too. I mean, he's kind of a social friend and we've been in plays and stuff together. And um, but to him, I don't think it was an insult to him. I think it was a flattering thing to do. I just don't think he'd been reading a paper that week and, and realized how the mood had turned on those sorts of impudent flirtations. Yes, it he had grabbed your rear end. Yeah, yeah. well. He could have rested his hand on it. He didn't really grab it. But was, <laughs> yeah. the rest of the evening that was so surprising when he kind of buried himself up against Marion Ross, who's quite the yeah. lady in her hair. And there were 400 of us, 400 of us baffled, hoping that he was going to make a speech about flirting in this new age and, and the uh, flattery that it was intended. But he didn't sum that up or make that speech. I hope in, as a result of my book, maybe he will. Yeah, that was, and you said she just looked so uncomfortable too when that yeah. happened. Yeah. It's I not just, like they were buddies, you know, they oh. had to together and uh, she was uncomfortable. It was strange. Oh my. But and a lot well, of men don't realize that they made women uncomfortable in those days. Right. Well, you're, you're, when you talked about uh, Henny Youngman, oh my goodness. And now you just stared right at him, stared him down and he just, yeah, <laughs> I mean, and so that and back kind of, then, that took a lot of courage to do. It sure did. It sure well, did. those, you know, it was like his entitlement and my indignation were just pitted against each other. There was no apology forthcoming. It was sort of like I got away with it was sort of the feeling in those mm -hmm. days. I'm lucky. I never suffered any assaults. I've never been really hurt by any of this. Mm -hmm. I read about what's happened to, to film actresses, put in compromising positions for jobs, people whose rooms were broken into. I was fortunate I never had that, those sorts of traumatic experiences. So I can't say I was traumatized by any of these impudent 
reaches and grabs. I knew from their intent it was flattering, and from my intent was like, this is just one of those things we survive and brush off. Mm -hmm. Women my age had so many situations where it was easier to just brush it off than go into it and jeopardize what, what standing we had in our workplace. Mm -hmm. And, Which and is so yeah, different now with the Me Too movement and everything. It is. So, and they're still fighting, though. I mean, absolutely. it's different, but they still have to fight it, you know. And you're, and it's so interesting to find out what people had to go through. And just like Colleen saying, oh, my gosh, I, I can't believe that these people were doing these things. But, but you know, actually, I can't believe it. So. Yeah. <laughs> Which led to with the Henny Youngman thing. Right. You said how your father was actually, you know. Tickled. Yeah, tickled by it, which led to the, the complicated uh, life. I mean, that you, you had, you know, kind of a, a tough upbringing. Your mother was very loving, but it was very difficult. And it was didn't crazy. Mm -hmm. It was like Hell's a Poppin'. I don't know if you remember those that movie, You're Pretty Young. Uh, oh, Hell's thank you. Poppin'. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs> to me, everybody is really young now. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it was a movie with everybody in it, from Sid Caesar to Buddy Hackett. Everybody was in it, and they were all, like, going around the world looking for some buried treasure things. So there was all kinds of wackiness in it. But that's how our our house our house was sort of always on the verge of screaming, but then you'd laugh instead. Because mm -hmm. there was just so much tension. And right. so I think I was attracted to Black comedy very young as a consequence of that, to, to cope. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true of a lot of people that go into comedy. Yeah. That they have a they have a fear of going into the grief or the horror or the shame, and so they go into uh, ridicule, sardonic, sarcastic behaviors instead. So, mm -hmm. and that's interesting because you talk about um, you know the time in the '70s with Saturday Night Live and how you kind of did uh, Fridays, which was a takeoff on comedy. What was that experience like? Well, first, you know, they cast a bunch of iconoclastic comedians. Um, Larry David, Michael Richards, uh, Mark Blankfield, a wonderful physical comedian, Bruce Mahler. I knew Larry David and Bruce Mahler from my stand-up at the Improv Days in New York. Uh, we were all working on material, me less successfully than them. Uh, and um, so when I got to the set, it was very familiar to have them there. We all had these wild ideas about what we wanted to do with the show. But since ABC was producing the show, they determined that they were just going to imitate whatever NBC was doing. We were all to clone their material, and we were horrified. I didn't want to be Jane Curtin, who I'd been off Broadway with in a show called The Proposition. I thought, she'll just think I'm a thief. She's going to think I have no original ideas of my own. Um, but little by little, even though we our first sketch on Fridays was we actually played them. We put on yellow, you know, the yellow bees, the bees outfits. Mm -hmm. And I guess I was dressed as Gilda Radner, uh, you know, getting the noogies in her head from Bill Murray. And so we just sent up the expectation of us, uh, of what people would think. But little by little, we molted and we transformed, you know, the, the iconic stuff that they had done into our own sort of patterns and our ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask what it was like starting out as a comedian when you're running the circuits with comedians like you've mentioned, but there still were not a lot of female comics. No, Elaine Boozler was sort of the, the best, I felt. She was a, a great joke writer. I was never a joke writer. I was a premise writer. And um, she was hilarious. And um, then there was Bette Midler, who was singing. Uh, at the Improv Club, who we didn't know what she'd be, but she was extraordinary. She had a very specific point of view on herself. Um, and then there was one girl named Margie Grossman, who ended up being a writer on Seinfeld. And there was me, who had a very feminine approach. I wasn't trying to do a Phyllis Stiller. I was trying to be, you know, myself and send up ingenues and send up the confusion between men and women about what we should be. I did a lot of characters, like I did a Farrah Fawcett kind of character. And I satirized glamour. That was my stuff. And again, the improv was a place to try things out. I was not always successful in what I wanted to achieve. So I started writing comedy songs, like a love song to a man's foot, which kind of gave a point of view of a woman who really is very degraded and just feels so proud to have her man's foot on her lap. Um, so each song had an inherent kind of message. Um, and I kind of got selected to audition from Fridays because of that. 
stand-up act. So it did take me somewhere. I was also doing that act when I came out to Los Angeles. Bud Friedman, who owned the improv clubs at the time, uh, used to put me on to open the shows or close after Robin Williams or somebody extraordinary like that. So I would get their leftover laughs, like Robin would warm them up for me. And then I would go on and slip in his pools of sweat, uh, <laughs> you know, and try to, to take out some laughs out of exhausted patrons. So, so. Um, yeah. But Fridays was very wild. We worked six days a week. We wrote it. <clears throat> we started it. We, we competed to get things on. The women always wrote stuff. Very rarely did we get stuff on. It was very frustrating. Uh, they didn't get our sense of humor. It's not that they were suppressing us. The female sense of humor had not yet been approved mm -hmm. um, or understood. And I think now men in the last 10 to 15 years have really opened to strong female energy and points of view. And look how many women are producing mm -hmm. shows now. It's just wonderful. It is. Do you I think do that you didn't get on with your, with your writing uh, because the powers that be were male? I mean, were there any women in the positions that made decisions? We only had one writer on Fridays. I know that Saturday Night Live had uh, Rosie Schuster and Beats. They were very strong writers and they got a lot of stuff on. Mm -hmm. um, but our writer, female writer, kind of wrote with the guys. She didn't have as strong a female point of view as we craved. So we wrote some of our own stuff. We wrote like these, the Muzak sisters. We were doing punk rock songs as Muzak, like elevator music. So that was one of our sticks, and that was recurring for a while. Um, I wrote a lot. I wrote some of my jokes on the newscast. Mm -hmm. um, but overall, the men always starred in the sketches. The men always starred in the uh, musicals. And I was a trained singer. I was very frustrated that I never got a lead in a musical, but that was probably because there were not that many women taking the lead in politics at the time mm -hmm. or running war toward countries. So uh, we weren't written for because they're, it wasn't in life. We weren't reflecting any real life. Mm -hmm. But I think, yeah, I envy a lot of the women today who do get a lot of support from females and males in the industry to follow their dream, follow their voice. Even Lorne Michaels was a very supportive uh, developer of the female material, like especially Gilda's material, mm -hmm. certainly. And she had Alan Zweibel in her corner to develop material for her. He really got her and mm -hmm. um, she was fortunate. I know that uh, my friend Lorraine Newman was equally frustrated in her uh, work in the trenches on Saturday Night Live that she wasn't written for, even though she's mm -hmm. an incredibly talented comedian. So that was our, you know, we were the supporting players and then we smiled and worked through it, but it was frustrating. Mm -hmm. It was frustrating. Yeah. And it sounds like, oh, <laughs> I'm well, no, just going to delay, Colleen. Um, I, uh, I mean, like, I think, I think you're, maybe we're not hearing each other at the right time, but, um, um, oh boy, where was I going to say? <laughs> um, I just feel like uh, that I know it. I I just felt like like through each uh, from reading your book and from each phase that you just kept moving along, like things just didn't um, stop you, and that um, I was trying to think how you had said it in there. I think you weren't really seeking fame. Is that what? Um, no, I just wanted to make about a that. I wanted to do what I loved and make a living at it. And, you know, I worked so hard at it that that came as a byproduct. Mm -hmm. And that was a very surprising byproduct. Uh, but you had to keep yourself noisy in order to be thought of for new roles. Otherwise, people didn't know who the heck you were. Right. So I, I managed to do a lot of different things, you know, simultaneously. And I loved exploring all the talents of myself and other people. Um, I was in a lot of improv companies. And you could do anything you wanted in improv. I don't know. You must have improv in Nashville. If not oh, yeah. Yeah. My so, son's, um, yeah, done it at Second City in Los Angeles. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a fine art form now. It's evolved so much since I started it out. We mm -hmm. all play it by the same rules, but each group innovates and creates and runs with those rules in, in new and novel ways. I think every, every town, every city, I mean, here we do a lot of musical improv. That's what I did off-Broadway with uh, Jane Curtin. We did... Uh, we took suggestions from the very New York university oriented audience of uh, musicals to do. And uh, we had a template. Uh, the musicians had a certain series of choruses in different keys that they would play. And there was a simultaneity, simultaneity of spontane, spontaneous co-creation where we would take the audience suggestion and run with it. 
for example, our finale was a big improvised musical, which looked like, wow, how did they do that? But actually we knew the opening number would be about the place, like, oh, here we are at the zoo, at the zoo. The next number would be the ingenue's lament. Sometimes I was the ingenue about how she couldn't find love, you know, at the zoo. And then the next scene would be the juvenile, you know, uh, talking to his friend, his confidant about how he wanted to find love and he wanted to go out and make it big in the world. And then the next scene is the villain rears his or her ugly head and, and intimidates the ingenue. Then the juvenile comes in and somehow saves the day with something to do with the zoo or one of the aspects of that suggestion. And um, then we'd have a big finale where the juvenile and the ingenue unite. And so we knew that much. We knew that those elements and, and templates would come into play, but filling in the blanks was still pretty creative. Wow. Pretty inventive, yeah. Did you enjoy Broadway or television more? Whatever had a great story and a great little bit for me to play, I, I enjoyed. I still feel, no matter the size of the vehicle, if I can bring it to life with my contribution, that's what I'm excited about. And working with talented people, I'm so rich in knowing some of the most talented people in our business um, currently. Um, it's one thing to have friends, but then to have these friends also have this skill set that's so extraordinary. You don't know whether it's God given or panic driven. You know, you don't really know where does that talent come from. That's one of the things I talk about in the book is, is this just some freak of nature thing? Or is this something that you want, you want to please people so terribly that you'll resort to, you'll go to all kinds of extremities. And that's what's called talent. But for some people, it's just so easy. Some people are just so easily naturally talented that there doesn't seem to be any effort at all. And so they are channeling some, some otherworldly thing that mm -hmm. speaks to them alone. Right. And you do talk about the fact that a lot of comedians kind of have a dark story in their past that, kind of, that they kind of naturally start going into comedy as a protective or coping mechanism. Yeah, yeah. And they also may want to educate people about how to avert those pitfalls that they have averted. And comedy is a really great way to teach. You know, you're sort of giving people information painlessly. They don't know they're swallowing the medicine because the sugar, spoonful of sugar makes it go down. Easily. So, um, yeah, uh, edutainment, we call it. Huh. Like Great way to that. teach. I like that is that. Cool, cool. So it was a wild time in the 70s, I would imagine. I mean, you had John Belushi and Gilda Radner and, and Lorraine Newman. And then, on, you know, you guys had your Larry David. And what was that yeah, like? Yeah. I mean, I can't even imagine what was, that was like, all that energy and all that talent. It was a cyclone. I mean, um, hang on to your hats. It was a very <laughs> tough schedule for Saturday Night Live and for Fridays. Um, you know, you're creating a new show every week, an hour and a half long. It's a lot of material. And of course, a lot, a lot of this we were gestating in advance weeks before. Then we decided, oh, because of what's going on in the news, we'll, we'll rekindle this sketch and perfect it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it was really good to be young to be doing that because you had to have the sharpest of minds and the most muscularly available body, vocally and physically. Um, so it felt like the right thing to be doing at that age. I don't think I'd want to do it now. I think it's very <laughs> strenuous. Um, but I love watching Saturday Night Live still. I, I <laughs> just, I'm ex ex so impressed by the, the level of talent and the way the writers adapt to every new star. I watched it the other night and Timothy Chalamet was on. Mm -hmm. Did you see him? Yes, that's on that, yeah. yeah. They yeah. somehow included, first of all, his incredible acting uh, gift but also his awkwardness, his sort of uh -huh. physical awkwardness and youth. And uh, I just thought it was masterful. Yeah. Really it, interesting. It's so interesting. You know, I don't think they really let the public know until recently just how hard that work is. Like you said, six and a, you know, six and a half days a week or six days a week, you are just going. And, and that is intense hard work. And I, I don't know how people with families um, that demand a lot of them can do that. I mean, I, I, don't I, think any of us, I don't think any of us had families back then. Mm -hmm. If we were too busy, we would have been very neglectful. Uh -huh. I think Michael Richards was married with a wife and daughter. Mm -hmm. um, and then Mark Blankfield was married to another of our cast members named Brandis Kemp. 
Mm -hmm. But I think the show was very hard on these relationships. I mean, our hours were, which is also to say there was a lot of cocaine um, in the writer's <laughs> rooms, and this sort of stoked their energy to beyond caffeinated. So their intent was to stay up all night, writing all night, because they didn't want to be alone with their high. So it put a lot of stress on those of us who were not so degenerate and who were professional. <laughs> I mean, I was a theater girl. We had very strict rules about behavior and conduct on sets. But because of the craziness of being inventive all the time, there was a certain laissez-faire liberty uh, uh, for the guys on set. They could go kind of crazy if they want to, which could be very intimidating to be around. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote a number of sketches, kind of improvised under the uh, under the aegis of Michael Richards' Battle Boy scenes. I don't know if you ever watched Fridays. I, I but, did watch it, but it's I remember, like but I reviewed. I reviewed some more just to remember, but I don't remember that. So yeah, go there's ahead. Some on you, there's some on YouTube, but the concept that he came up with quite brilliantly was there's a sandlot backyard in some new suburb, suburban tract, and a brother, a little brother sees uh, the yard as a battleground for his soldiers, and the little girl sees it as a picnic ground for Barbie and Ken or something like that. And they have these dueling points of view, female and male, even in childhood, for the possession and the point of view on this turf. And I really loved doing those with him. He would go crazy and I would just work with him and go with whatever he did. But yeah. he would get violent in those scenes. He would set things on fire. He bit my doll's heads off. I mean, it was, it was funny uh -huh. uh, because of the intensity of his violence and the horrible crushed you know, behavior of my, my little girl. Yeah. Uh, but it was wild in the creation. And sometimes when we were on live television, they would, they would just go for it, these guys. They would just go for it. Anything for a laugh. Yeah, I, I was watching one where you're in it with Michael Richards and Andy Kaufman. Oh and yeah. The, the water, he pours water on Michael Richards. Yeah. Was that planned or was that all improv or? I well, the whole hello. week we had that sketch to do and I kept thinking there's no ending on this sketch why is there no ending written into this sketch so before the show went up that night Jack Burns our producer head writer took the cast aside and said Andy's going to blow out of this sketch and I want you all to improvise and stay in character and go with it like you know you didn't know it was going to happen so that's what we did I stayed in my prissy little wife character and and Michael got very aggressive and threw the cue cards at Andy when he didn't want to go on and you know, and they were about to get into fisticuffs and then the crew, which had not been informed about this improvisation, really leapt to the fray and they were going to like beat him up. I was really frightened for him. Oh, so it was an improvisation, very loosely planned, but it looked real. And oh, yeah. I'm embarrassed <laughs> to say we got the best ratings we had ever gotten on that night of the show. Wow. Because that I, was like just watching this like you know and i know andy kaufman just from the watching other things he did they were really like just something people didn't do before uh, they were the physicality crazy. too just yeah insane yeah, the, rec the recklessness of it i mean he got hurt many times but i think andy had an obsession with getting attention even if it was negative mm -hmm. uh, he didn't just want to be famous he wanted to be infamous Mm -hmm. you know incendiary and uh we just all went with it when i knew him back in new york he was more of a nice jewish guy you know uh -huh. just getting started doing his mighty mouse routine yes. I don't know if you ever saw that oh yeah oh yeah um, he was very bold very audacious and we were all stunned by the way he just listened to the mickey mouse record for like two minutes before he sang again and we would all be cracking up just to <laughs> yeah. Courage to stand there doing absolutely nothing but yes yeah and then speaking of different things and how improv I know I read and I saw the clip too where you um, had practiced not to get punched but you got punched yes <laughs> and, yes you can you talk me. about that <laughs> Mary, Mary Edith and I had worked staging that fight with a professional fight coordinator the whole week and in her zeal or in the tension of being on live TV, she connected, she actually hit me. And so I had to go through the rest of the show with a broken tooth bleeding, but it was funny, got a lot of laughs, and then it got a lot of attention. We were you know, interviewed on Entertainment Tonight about this cat fight, there was no cat fight. It was just a mistake. But watching that, you really held it together after that. I was watching that going, 
she really just got punched. And, mm -hmm. you know, and now I, I wouldn't have known if I was watching it for the first time, but you really held it together after that. I don't know how you did I'm that. I'm a trooper. What can I do? <laughs> I was like, You're a professional. <laughs> I really, I do not know how you did that. Um, yeah. Together like yeah that. I was too much of a trooper maybe, but you know, back in those days, um, I certainly wanted to succeed in my work and I, 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 you know, took a lot of blows emotionally and otherwise, but I really wanted to get married. I really wanted to have a, a man in my life and they were some transitory men, but I hadn't really formed my own self sufficiently to choose a mate for life. Um, I think when you're an actor, this is my experience anyway, uh, you keep your personality liquid so you can do all kinds of different things. Mm -hmm. And the problem with, with that is you don't always have a strong center as a woman um you know with which to date mm -hmm. uh with which to love so it took me a really long time to get it right and that's why the book is so long i mean i just <laughs> well look it's interesting your book does kind of chronicle essays from different times in your life and you do talk about finding your husband in your 60s which is amazing what was it like you know getting married in your 60s what made you decide that now is the right time because he asked me <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think that he and I both had settled a lot in our lives at that time. We had had other long-term relationships. He had had a, a wife and two children, you know, that, that had ended 20 years before. I had had a relationship that ended 20 years before. So he had no hangover shadow relationships. We could see each other clearly. Um, there was a rocky beginning because we were both dating other people. And, you know, that's always a difficult de-escalation. Uh, when do you let someone know? Uh, you may have found somebody important, but don't tell that person they may be important because that might light it up. So it's a very interesting cross phase. So I have a story in the book about internet dating in your 60s, which I think a lot of women will find illustrative, educational. Um, there's a lot of dating online going on right now amongst my peers, yeah. actually. Mm -hmm. uh, very cautious. You know, meeting for the first time has never been more precarious. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're, you have to really trust somebody to even be 10 feet away from them in this era. So right. trust is even more important than it's ever been before. It's not about titillation at all in online dating. I don't know how Tinder works. I never invented <laughs> when I was dating. But there's a, you know, it's not just the AIDS card, it's the V card, the vaccination one and two card that we're all going to need to prove our dependability and worthiness to actually meet and join a pod before we can get romantic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah, online dating, I have a, I have a piece about it in the book. Uh, it was kind Very of nutty. <laughs> in my yes. I so you, you pivoted towards after, you know, in the, I guess, 90s was when, Rug, late 90s when Rugrats came out, I think. Well, we actually did the pilot in 1989. Wow. How did you still... turn into voice act? Like, why did you pivot into voice acting? Well, I think all of us actors were doing voice acting on commercials and, you know, voiceovers, stuff like that. I had done a lot of voiceovers in New York and in LA. They were kind of of the review, like a man and a woman doing a sketch about a product. I was very good at those. Um, and so I just had my first animated audition for this show called Rugrats, which was just a concept at the time. And the character's description was so much like how I would describe my own mother, a kind of an anxious person trying to hold her family together, never confident that she knows exactly what to do. It reminded me of my own mother in all actuality. So I use my mother's voice. My mother's voice is like mine, only pitched somewhat differently, a little higher, a couple octaves higher. And there's a kind of an anxiety to my mother um, and a repression. So it was a very easy fit for me. And then I was you called made back. my day. I'm sorry, but you just. <laughs> <laughs> what? You, you just, just made just... my day. <laughs> Oh, my kids are going to be like, wow, mom. Oh, oh that was so easy. Wow, I'm well, thank you. <laughs> my callback was fortunately with two men I worked with before, the wonderful Jack Riley, now gone, and a man named oh, David. What was his last name? I forgot. Oh, forgive me. I'll, I'll write you it. I okay. forgot his name. Okay. He's now gone, too. But anyway, we had to do this improvisation where we were quarreling about where the babies went. This was a family that never knew where the children were. They never did. <laughs> <You know? laughs> 
I had known where the children were, none of those episodes could have taken place. But anyway, we were getting into a bit of a quarrel about where the children were. And I, as the Dee Dee character, just completely lost it, started shouting and frothing and squeaking. So um, I got the part. And then I, I was asked to audition for her, the role of her mother from the old country, uh, Minka. And so I auditioned on the phone with the Nickelodeon, exec, Nickelodeon executives and the creative team on the telephone on different extensions and um, got that part too. And that was really an honor. I didn't have grandparents anymore at the time. So I had to go to the Jewish area of, of Los Angeles, the Fairfax district and study up. You know, there were a lot of those kinds of women, somewhat plump uh, with a gray bun, stockings around their ankles. That was like a cliche, I'm, I'm sorry to say, back in, in my day, the early 90s, they were still very much a presence. Now, Russian people coming to this country don't look like that anymore. They look like West, Westerners. Mm -hmm. They're wearing jeans and sharp <laughs> haircuts and, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I was privileged to play that, that class of woman uh, uh -huh. for a while. And all the different producers on the show had a different version of what she should be like. So it's constantly having to update or revamp the character. Um, uh -huh. So anyway, it was a challenge for a while. Oh, and then you was, there were movies with it too. So you were doing the, movies. And we also had action figures. Oh, 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 let me show you. Let me yeah. show you. <laughs> <laughs> we, I think we had some. <laughs> oh, I'm sure we did. Yeah. Oh, I know. Well, I saw Rugrats live. Did you have? Did you ever see Rugrats? No, live? I didn't take the kids <laughs> to see Rugrats. Oh my gosh! <laughs> oh, Dee Dee, Dee Dee's Dee Dee. holding Dee Dee. And, and, uh, <laughs> oh my gosh, Minka? that's amazing! This was Minka, the Jewish. Minka. <laughs> and then uh, we have us, uh, Boris, Boris, who talk like this. Boris, <laughs> character. So anyway, what can I say? It was a privilege. It was a total gas. It was. We yeah. saw a lot of it. Colleen and I have children in their 20s. So I was telling Colleen, I went to Rugrats Live. They came to Pittsburgh and my kids got to see Rugrats Live. <laughs> I, was, I was the singing voice for Dee Dee. Oh, you were? Okay, I was going to ask you that. Did you do the voice at Rugrats Live? I did. I didn't go on the the road but I pre-recorded it yeah that's that awesome. the show, they had the big styrofoam heads like they had big styrofoam heads they might they had I remember there was a flashlight in it <laughs> there was like this <laughs> flashlight character because then they started selling the flashlights like going through the oh yes merchandising. <laughs> merchandising. they made a lot of money off that that's for sure <laughs> they did uh, yes no. uh, in, in in the store in your book too just throughout the whole book the um the whole, the stories of you rushing to catch bus to bus to get somewhere, to go to this audition. Um, and the one that really stood out was your, uh, when you, your first Broadway play with Raul Julia. Mm -hmm. And how crazy that was. Can you tell a little bit, without give, giving it away, about the the big thing where something <laughs> fell? I mean, can you the talk outer about space. that? Yes. Well, I think you, you may have heard of Spider-Man, which was done about 10 oh, years yeah. ago. And all the, uh, the enormous special effects that were part of that show, making it more cinematic than just theater. Uh, and all the injuries and accidents and mm -hmm. how many actors risked risk their lives to make that show a hit. Well, this was back in um, 1972. This show was a heavily laden special effects show about... Um, a renegade escapees from Earth. Earth has now become a homogenized planet where everybody is intermarried and there's a blue race. And the entire blue race wears control hats. Uh, they are controlled from some offstage tower, uh, when to fornicate, when to uh, rebel, what jobs to do. And Raul Julia plays a uh, garbage man on that planet who is designated the driver to deliver trash to further and further regions of outer space. It's very contemporary, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, they're dumping trash onto other planets, and they're headed for our planet to dump a whole lot of trash. But we uh, kidnap him, pull his, um, his spaceship down onto our rebel planet called Ithaca in order for him to mate with our queen, uh, because our king has now atrophied into just a head in a robot that goes around the state. Anyway, in short, the big finale was that Earth is coming to get us. They want to retrieve Raul, or uh, Gabriel, his name was in the play, and they want to kidnap us all who have 
intermingled and become different color races. I'm a green character, others are orange. And um, we build this enormous rocket ship whose uh, feet, I don't know what you call it, the, the tail was on the stage and took up the entire stage. And at the end of the play, we were to rise into this um, rocket ship and smoke would come out and we would be on this like fire escape, all, all 40 people in the show and rise up into this, plan, uh, into this spaceship and take off into outer space. We were opening a brand new theater called the Eurus. It was the first new theater on Broadway in decades. And the cement in the ceiling was not quite dry enough to hold up the winches with all of our body weight on it. And so as we first mounted on a preview night before the show opened onto the staircase and we're singing the finale, which is called New Jerusalem, a very stirring finale. And the orchestra's playing under us and the special effects, the quadraphonic sound is like booming through the theater. We heard creaking and, and metal scraping and then the entire staircase pulled out of the winches in the ceiling and fell through the stage. And a lot of people were injured and terrified and hurt. A lot of people left the show. Uh, I survived. I had a, you know injuries to my hands, not severe, just bruising. But anyway, the show went on. And it was not a hit after all that risk and all that expense. Uh, we closed in a couple of weeks. But it was the talk of the town for a while. Everybody wanted to come and see the calamity that was Via Galactica. Was, which was the name of the show, it was called Road to the Stars. And it was my first Broadway show. I, who had loved Broadway, all the old fashioned musicals, I was to be part of this groundbreaking thing. And it turned out to be really groundbreaking. Yeah, Literally. And, <laughs> yeah, and you talk about too, how the, the dilemma between, do we honor our contract? Are they gonna say we break our contract? That is something I think a lot of people don't realize actors face as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's very, it's a physically ris risky business, you know, even if you're not hired to be a stunt person or do your own stunts, there are elements of risk involved, unless you're doing a no coward play, perhaps, um, which is pretty staid and safe and predictable. But yeah, that was my first Broadway show and I was crushed and disappointed, but luckily I got to do another Broadway show before I left New York yeah. and did some off Broadway too. I still love Broadway, I miss it. Oh, please bring it back, please. Oh. So There's a level of grief, I think, in all actors that we're carrying around right now, you know, yeah. missing our fellow players. Yeah. When it comes to more modern now today comedy, we've, we've interviewed people like Patricia Heaton, who is a natural comic and she's very funny, but who else do you look to that kind of, you see that natural ability to be funny on TV or, or film? Oh, there's so many. I think Amy Schumer turned out to be a very good actress. I loved her in Trainwreck. Mm -hmm. um, you know, now she's got a baby and I'm not sure how active she'll be, but she's one of my idols, Tiffany Haddish. She oh. came out of nowhere with all the presence and verve of a big star. It was like, she was ready to go. I didn't know about her knocking around and doing stand up and living out of her car for a number of years. Um, mm -hmm. She's one of my idols. She's the loosest and she's a very naturalistic actress. Oh amazing. Um, let me see who else. Well, Sarah Cooper is very funny. I'm not sure what she'll do next. Sarah Cooper is the person that was impersonating Trump doing his voice. Oh, yes. Okay. The girl on TikTok or on... I yeah, don't know yeah. She, yeah. Gave her, yes. She gave her her own special and she was very oh poised gosh. and wonderful. I'm not sure what will happen next. It'd be an interesting thing to determine. Yeah. Uh, I, of course, love Phoebe Waller-Bridges, who created Fleabag. Mm -hmm. She is hilarious. And it has changed the nature of producing for women, I think. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's so many. Are there any <laughs> you like? Do you guys like anyone in particular? Oh, I, I, well, I like Kate McKinnon a lot. Oh, my uh, God. Oh, I would say she's top of the list for me. Katie Perry. Katie, scary. Yes. She, uh, she, can be, she can morph into anyone. She can. Uh, Chloe Feynman. Um, oh, has, is that, say that again? Uh, Chloe Feynman. She's oh, on Saturday Night Live and she. Hmm has a really big Instagram page, a lot of following. Chloe is crazy. She does all kinds of impersonations. Um, I know my daughter is a huge fan of hers. So uh -huh. these are, you know, just some, but you know, just, I loved comedy growing up, like just love. So I, I was like, okay, I know, I knew who you are from, you know, when I was a kid and everything. But um, 
you know, so I, I am so thrilled to see these that female uh, comedians coming out. And well, I, I, I'm also thrilled that people like, oh, now I've forgotten her name, Penelope Feather, I forgot her name. She played Camilla Parker Bowles in The Crown. Uh, oh, I know who you're talking about. I, well, I'm I mean, she names. was on Call the Midwife. Bridget's great with names. I'm I, I can't names. remember her name either, but she she was on Call the Midwife as well. She played a nurse. One on of my Midwife. favorite shows. Yeah. She was also a show showrunner for Killing Eve. Oh, love that yeah, too. Phoebe Waller Bridger. Yeah. And she's written this movie for Carrie Mulligan that's just opened called Promising Young Woman. Oh, I've heard. Okay. I haven't so watched this, it yet, but I heard about it. Yeah. This young woman, I mean, she is an idol of mine because she's doing it all and simultaneously. What an yeah. energetic what an energetic force she is. It's, uh, it's yeah, it's crazy. Um it, or it's amazing. It's it's encouraging to right. see all of the things that that these women are doing. And, and I and just do. wish I was younger and could be doing all that they're doing when there was more permission to do that and you didn't have to really become a bitch. <laughs> yeah. Like those sorts of things. I mean, look what Barbara Streisand went through to direct her own pictures and oh, yeah. how extraordinary they turned out to be, like Yentl yeah. and, and other projects that she mm -hmm. held. Mm -hmm. uh, but we really had to be annoying you know, in those yeah. days. And now we're just strong. We're considered strong. strong. And we don't want, we can't whine, we can't be petulant. We just can be entitled and confident. Yes. And then Very. I think, well, I think you said you wish, but I think you helped pave the way for that. I think oh, you absolutely. did. I know. Yeah. I, I mean, you may say you wish you were younger, but you did a lot, <laughs> you know, and, and your book also is just so entertaining. And it's actually, I love the way that it's written because you can read a little bit at a time. Yep. And so I was just like, oh, I, I just want to read the next one. I want to read the next story because yeah. they're, they're, you know, kind of individual stories. Right. They go in and out of different time frames. And it's not like the story of when you were young into when you're, it goes back and forth. So you can definitely read it in segments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you get to pick it up and put it down, and yeah, yeah. I, I, I like that about my book also. I, yeah, <laughs> if you have to say so yourself. <laughs> and I did want to ask because I think I forgot to ask, and I, I hate to take up any more of your time, but uh, oh, can you no, talk I'm about? Oh, my mom, I'm very long. <laughs> well, I wanted you to. What prompted you to put this all into a book? Well, you know, I first I thought it was a one woman musical and I been, I started, you know, I have songs that go with it and I was performing, I was commissioned by the Joshua Tree Comedy Festival here in California to perform it at their summer festival. And um, then I thought, well, maybe it's a stage play. So the Jewish Women's Theater produced a few scenes out of what became the book. Then I also thought it was a movie about the relationship between the mother and the daughter in the book, which is a through line throughout my relationship with my mother, but I wrote it as a movie and I shot a trailer for it. So I, I saw these stories being um, produced in many different forms. I still do. I'd like it to be on modern love. I, I think several of the chapters here would be a great modern love episode, but that's the next, next mm -hmm. chapter. Um, and then a literary agent saw me doing the Baroness, that Baroness story. And she said, this is a book. It's very literary. And, um, you know, it's entertaining and you really need to write a book. So she kicked my ass into writing this book. It took me about a year, I'd say. Mm -hmm. um, and then we took it out and, uh, you know, it had a few rejections and I got a really small publisher and I'm really happy with how it's turned out. I think they've done a great job there in Nashville. Oh, <laughs> yay, <is>. yay. <laughs> and um, yeah, so it feels like a consummation of a lot of different ideas. Uh, mm -hmm. and, in, and, and luckily for me, uh, horrible for most, is that the pandemic occurred and people wouldn't be going to the theater to see a musical and they probably wouldn't be going out to the movies to see a movie, um, that this little capsule, encapsulation of my life stories is very portable. It's, I have it recorded on Audible, which is very entertaining. I do all the voices of my parents and everybody else. And... Um, and it's also in an ebook format. People can easily download it, read it on their phones, and there'll be a book, which I will autograph for folks that send me the book through the mail to my post office box with a self addressed stamped envelope. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I will be happy to autograph it and send it back to them. Oh, that's so, wonderful. Well, we, yeah. we can include all of that on our show notes, too. I'll give you the address. The mailing address is um, 
it's uh, me, care of 10573 West Pico Boulevard, number 314, Los Angeles 90064. And if they send me their purchase book, I'll be happy to, with a self-addressed stamped envelope, okay. turn it around, autograph it, personalize it. Okay. That's so nice. That's so great. That's great. We'll, we'll definitely share that information. We also wanted to let people know that in addition to the book, you also have a little side thing going where you are teaching Zoom. Well, you're teaching how to Zoom. Can you explain that a little bit? Well, I've been teaching a long time in classes and one-on-one -on, -one on, uh, Skype for the last few years. And now I'm primarily teaching on Zoom and Skype and Google. Um, I teach charisma. Uh, I don't mean that you need to be the most st stellar performer in the world, slick and strange and glamorous, but whatever your inner voice tells you you are, if there's something in your behavior that contradicts the inner message that you mean to put across, very good at clearing that away and supporting your message. Uh, Marshall McLuhan, who is a visionary, person in the television and media world said, um, the medium is the message. If you have a very confident message, but your body language and your voice projection do not put that across, you can contradict your message and kind of deflate your, the strength of your intent. So I coach people all over the world. I'm working with women in Australia who are trying to melt the glass ceiling in their agricultural corporate business, the glass ceiling in themselves first, and then the glass ceiling around them in a patriarchal establishment. And I'm working with a young man in Atlanta who wants to be a voice actor, and uh, a young woman in Detroit who just wants to have more confidence to interface in her world after very repressive parental upbringing, I might add. So I, um, I work very quickly, and uh, my fees are on charismatizing.com. I'm very reasonable because I like doing it so much. Um, I'm not in it for the money. I'm in it to give so much of what I've learned from so many extraordinary teachers and exemplars of strong presence that I really want to impart as much as I can to men and women. But it's, and it's so it's so cool too because it's it does you don't have to be in one particular profession to benefit oh, from this. You yeah. know, I work with software developers who want to become entrepreneurs. I work with politicians. Mm -hmm. I've worked with uh, uh, Catholic journalists who want to host their own shows, and I actually helped produce a show for one of my clients who became like the Bill Moyers of churches. Uh, we would film at um, beautiful churches like Mission San Juan Capistrano here in Southern California, or St. Charles Church at Harvard in Boston. Mm -hmm. um, had a lot of adventures shooting that show, and I learned so much about the Latin Mass, oh, uh, which wow. is kind of a you know a fundamentalist. It's like Hebrew to the Jews. It's like the aboriginal language of the church. Wow. And uh, I got to see some beautiful churches and artwork work and uh, architecture, incredible ancient architecture of these churches, uh, which are beautiful places, places of meditation, you know, all over the world. So uh, my coaching in charisma has led me on some interesting adventures. Wow. That's that is amazing. sweet. Yeah. I want to thank you so much for coming on today and make sure that, you know, all of your information is going to be in the show notes. So Odd Woman Out will, you know, a link for that and, and for Charisma and all of that amazing stuff. But we want to thank you for sharing your stories today. I think uh, you know, our listeners are going to love hearing them and just, it's been a pleasure. So thank you. Yeah, My pleasure, Colleen and Bridget. Great to meet you. Our paths don't cross again. Stay safe, stay healthy, you and too. spread the love. Okay, Thank and just so stay on for one minute. Okay, thanks. Hi, this is Melanie Chardoff, and you're listening to me and Bridget and Colleen on Hot Flashes, Cool Topics. Thank you so much, Melanie, for coming on the show and telling us all these good stories. We really enjoyed it. And, you know, pers a personal thank you for doing the Dee Dee Pickles, because I'm going to oh, go yeah. show this to my kids, right? Okay. <laughs> but her book is out now. Um, it came out the beginning of February, so check that out. What right. a great storyteller. So and thank make you. sure you check out her if you want any help with the um, coaching or any char charisma. It's uh, charismatizing.com is her website for that. And also she has her YouTube channel. And make sure to uh, check our YouTube channel out as well because we have one. We have a lot of great um, videos up on IGTV, on Instagram, you name it. We're everywhere. 
for everywhere. Yes. So have a great week, guys, and we will talk to you next time. Bye.